Hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I feel a bit like an interloper, just gate crashing the end of your conference, turning up for the last day. Uh, but I've been on holiday, so I, 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 although I was jealously watching your uh, your visits to other places and thinking, oh, that would have been nice. I can't complain because I had loads of lovely sunshine <laughs> on a holiday that I haven't been on for two years. So it's very exciting. Um, so thank you, Chris. I am. Uh, Rachel, I'm the curator of botany at Manchester Museum, and uh, I am, first off, not a historian and not a pharmacist. Um, so <laughs> I apologise in advance that I'm a, a plant scientist. So I did my PhD in seed germination. Uh, I worked at the Millennium Seed Bank project down near Haywards Heath, um, and I now work looking after the collections at Manchester Museum. So. I know you've been on two lovely tours, um, but under other circumstances, if this conference had happened a few years ago, I might have been doing one of those tours and giving you a visit around our collection. So normally I'm welcoming people into our lovely space, um, but you did go to the Rylands and that is fabulous. Um, <clears throat> So this is the herbarium. This is the, the attic store of the museum. Um, we're part of the University of Manchester and we house something like up to 900,000 uh, botanical objects, uh, which is quite a lot. <laughs> um, so we get um, a number of sort of uh, student projects, activities, but the main thing we're doing is uh, a museum that's open to the public. And at the moment we are not, which is very strange for us all. So we're, we're closed for renovations because we've had a giant extension put on the side. And so we are currently reworking all our galleries to open at the beginning of next year. And so the museum's currently shut, which is why I wasn't on your list of tours. Um, so the museum started really with a, a natural history cabinet from a man called John Lee Phillips. Um, and there was a, a, a society that formed um, after his death, the preservation of natural history. And they bought this cabinet to start a small museum for their society. And it was very much a kind of members only uh, space to come and, and admire the objects that they had. Apparently he had quite an excellent world renowned collection of, of birds. So this was on Peter Street in the centre of Manchester. Um, and much like many of these societies, they began to get into financial difficulties because they weren't attracting the levels of membership really to get enough people coming through the doors. So this is a book we found in our archives fairly recently, which details the contents loosely of that museum and each of their prices of the material that was in there because they were struggling uh, to keep the, the society going. They wanted to sell off all their assets and, and close down. In many cities, that became the kind of municipal city museum, uh, you know, like Leeds or Sheffield City Museum. But it, Manchester had just built the art gallery. So the city corporation didn't have the finances to take on a natural history collection. And so it came to the University of Manchester, or as it was at the time then, Owens College. <laughs> so as the... Um, <clears throat> the Institute of Learning rather than the sort of civic museum. Um, but with that in mind, um, the, they, from the outset, although this collection was going to a university, they really wanted to have it as a museum that was open to the public. So this is a letter that um, is notifying people that they're trying to raise funds to build a museum to house this collection that the university has just taken receipt of. Um, so it has here, uh, as soon as circumstances would permit, suitable buildings should be erected for the proper exhibition and the public should be admitted free of charge and under fitting regulations. Um, <clears throat> So this is to build what we now know as the 1885 part of the museum of which the attic is the space that the herbarium sits in. So it was specifically built as a natural history museum by the same architect who built Manchester Town Hall, Strangeways Prison and the Natural History Museum. <laughs> exactly, Waterhouse. And so then as the museum, um, in fact, there it is, as the museum got extra bits of collection. Um, so it, 
it sort of gained a bit of kudos, I think, by being associated with an academic institution. People started making larger donations towards the museum. And so this isn't how it looks today because we've got extensions that come out in this direction. But they were also done by Waterhouse's son and Waterhouse's grandson. So it has something of a sort of uh, a facade that looks like it was deliberate and planned at the time. But at this point, in 1885, that's just the, uh, the, the natural history. Um, so art, this is my desk. <laughs> this is where the Materia Medica collection is. Uh, I've got the free run of the University Tower. And then we've, this is the herbarium on the, the top floor through here. I also like this because it shows that architect's drawings are always the same because you've got some ladies gossiping here and someone nonchalantly going past on their horse and you can just imagine it'd be the same if you were building something out of shiny steel today. <clears throat> so um, that first museum then in Peter Street was really something of uh, a kind of gathering of curiosities for titillating the visitors really it was for just um, amusement and so this is one of our uh, our nature's library gallery and so we've we've sort of given a nod to this history of the organization so this is our cabinet of curiosities case where we've laid out various things uh, that would have been there to be spectacular things that hadn't been seen before and then this point um, where the collections arrive in Owens College so that's the late 1860s they've got them for about 20 to 30 years sorting the collections out rearranging them according to the latest thinking of science uh, and then opening this museum in the late 1880s to display it to the public with a, a geology gallery a zoology gallery botany and so on um, so this here, sadly, the photograph, uh, this is the, the case doors, that there is relevant, but it's hidden behind, behind the photo. Uh, so this shows, um, this is a display which has the oldest accession we could find to each of our collections and the most recent accession at the point when we installed this, uh, this case. And you can see that the A register worked really nice for animals, the B register worked really nicely for entering uh, birds, and then beyond that it goes wrong because we've got C for reptiles and D for amphibians. And so by the time we reach botany, we're on K for no fathomable reason whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> so they, uh, they had these, the, the various sort of reasons for opening uh, the university's museum, a, a lot of it because the Owens College felt it should have that sort of authority along with Oxford and Cambridge that a museum was definitely the, the kind of institution that, uh, that a, a university that was going places needed and so it was going to be doing uh, not just supporting the students but all of the kind of civic things that the uh, general museum would be doing too. Um, <clears throat> So here we have the list of botany talks for 1901 and they're all about economic botany and the uses of plants rather than more about uh, botany as a how you would recognize plants and so on. So this is where we get to lots of pictures because this is when I show you lots of things that I would have out on tables. Um, so we have a uh, as I say, about 900,000 objects, and it covers the whole range of botany as the Victorians understood it at the time. So that includes all the, uh, the fungi, as well as all the different kinds of flowering plants, ferns, mosses, and so on. Um, we have material which is uh, boxed and 3D, lots of illustrations, lantern slides. There was quite an active microscopical society in the city. So we have about 15,000 uh, microscope slides. Um, and then this interest that was developing in economic botany. So lots of fibers, timbers, fruits and seeds, the plants that were useful, particularly because Manchester is sort of connected to Salford Keys, the trade that's coming in and those worldwide connections in raw materials that are coming in for use um, in the mills and the factories. So after the 
museum has been built and it's got its act together and it's sorted out the collections that came from the original society. That was very um, zoology focused really. So it had a lot of, as I say, birds, shells, really no botany to speak of. So this is our first accession register and you can see that K1, the first thing that comes into the museum is a specimen of cinchona. And so uh, the first 10, in fact, objects to come into the museum are all cinchona barks, of which I think we've got these ones and the labels have probably fallen off number one and two because we can't, <laughs> we can't distinguish them from any other bit of bark that's lurking there. However, it's fair to say that the majority of the collection is very flat, very pressed and well on its way to being quite brown. Um, so we've got something like three quarters of a million herbarium sheets of our flat pressed plants. Um, and these days our main users really are artists coming in for inspiration. But obviously at the time it was really for people who were exploring the plants of the world and trying to understand and categorize the plants that were out there. So I'm going to give you a quick whiz through our major donors because that's uh, relevant to the whole story and then move on slightly more to the pharmaceutical end. So I'm doing my donations in reverse order because this is least pharmaceutically um, relevant. It's Charles Bailey, he donates his collection in 1917. He went to an evening class from botany in Owens College, which inspired him to get into the subject and start collecting. And as well as microscopy, he was particularly interested in the plants of UK and Europe and whether they changed across their range, whether they looked different. And then plants which came in, um, so these are some of his early collections. This is two years after he's been to his evening class and he's learning to identify plants. Plants which come in um, accidentally on goods that are coming into the various um, ports around uh, the Northwest. So he's got, um, these are specimens for, of evening primroses that he has found newly growing um, around St. Anne's. Um, that he thinks have come in on bales of cotton and bales of wool and have started to call the UK their, their home. So he's interested in these plants that are kind of naturalizing in the UK and becoming wild growing around uh, the, the northwest of England. So yes, the sand hills I like as a word instead of sand dunes. So then in 1911, we get this collection. This is from Leo Grindon. So he is uh, an author and someone who gives tutorials in botany. And so his collection is very different in feel because it's like a giant scrapbook. So he's not interested in wild plants. He's only interested in those that are cultivated. He says he wants a, a, a plant that's capable of being the best that it can be from a garden rather than as he calls it, a dismal uninviting mummy from the native land. So he wants something that's a perfect specimen. And then he also collects uh, all the ephemeral information he can find about those plants. So it's essentially his kind of teaching reference material as a herbarium. So there's cuttings from uh, newspapers, there's articles from gardening magazines, there's all sorts of different kinds of illustrations. Um, and he's using this to support both his lectures and to write about the, the um, about 14 books he publishes on various subjects. Um, and so this has been kind of organized onto paper by the herbarium curators, because that's how they understand the world is stuck onto paper. Um, but he had it wrapped up in parcels with uh, string and it included <clears throat> material that he'd found from junk shops. So this page over here, is a page of Teatrum Botanicum, so the Theatre of Plants by John Parkinson. So he has found these various old herbals in terrible states in junk shops and split them apart and filed them with his plant material. So we've got, uh, we've got Historia Sturfum, Leonard Fuchs, we have Teatrum Botanicum and a few other sort of uh, incidental plates from uh, and woodcuts and things from notable books. So there's about 
260 different sources of printed materials. Some of them are really old <laughs> and some of them are very contemporary and the latest fashion in primroses for your garden or whatever. So it's crazily eclectic and very interesting. And because of that, in that interest in cultivated plants, there's also that sense of plants that are useful. So you do get in there things which are crops or things which are medic medicinal plants and material which is being used by people. So our third big donor then, <clears throat> this arrived in the museum in 1904. Um, James Cosmo Melville was, uh, well, he was the grandson of the last secretary of the East India Company and he married into the Dewhurst family of Manchester. So that was a really big cotton uh, firm. So he is both wealthy and highly, highly connected. And so rather than collecting his own material, he is acquiring things which come up for sale at auction. He is buying things from natural history dealers who are uh, circulating material. <clears throat> so this is a specimen of tea co uh, collected by Augustine Henry, the plant hunter in China. Um, and then he also, as you can see by these kind of printed labels, these are sets of plants from the Americas that he is getting uh, by subscription basically and, and sending through. So he has this extensive description of his herbarium and how he got all this material, where it came from. And then this is the first point where we get any significant mention of Materia Medica. So um, he describes leaving this small collection of economic plants and materia medica that was collected by the late Thomas Coward of Bowdoin. And so for the Manchester Museum, Thomas Coward is actually quite a significant name, but he's a significant name as an ornithologist. And having looked at him online and tried to read in a bit more about his life, he was also interested in astronomy. So I have genuinely no idea why he's interested in materia medica and has put together this collection of material. Um, but he did, and it's there, and we have several drawers of it. Um, <clears throat> and they all have this little label in the corner to say where it came from. Um, and uh, it's a complete mystery. So I, I do, you know, I think I will have to at some point find myself a, a, a happy student who would like to delve into some archives and find out more about what Mr. Thomas Coward of Manchester was doing <laughs> in order to, uh, to put together this material. Um, so this then is the entire museum's collection of plants, basically, arriving between 1904 and 1917, which I think sets the scene for the chaos that has happened ever since in terms of our understanding of where things came from, uh, what happened to them and so on. Because I imagine the curators at the time being utterly overwhelmed by these hundreds and hundreds of boxes to unpack and sort and get into some kind of order on the shelf. <clears throat> so those are the, the major collectors and they're, you know, hundreds of thousands of objects all within a couple of decades. Um, so in the late, uh, late 19th century, the, um, the collection was overseen by an assistant keeper who was kind of there on the ground doing work and then uh, a kind of academic lead who was sat in the science faculty. So for botany, it was this gentleman, F.E. Weiss, and we have this um, proceedings of the um, Museums Association um, conference pamphlet in which he's given a paper and you can read about his opinions on what a herbarium is or is not, how it relates to a museum or doesn't, how boring it might be, and, uh, <laughs> and what kind of material he feels he should have in it. So he has some quite strong, uh, strong views on whether anything of economic value should be considered part of the herbarium, which is a no. And then also that the herbarium itself is not to be considered part of the general museum because it's not instructive to the uninitiated, which is probably still a little true, um, <clears throat> uh, and the general public. So he thinks that it's something that should be used by the experts behind the scenes and not out there on display in the gallery. And so along with our backlog of massive work and terrible paperwork as a result of getting everything at the same time, 
there's also a bit of a tension between what the museum wants to be doing and what the academic overseers want to be doing, because this then is the assistant keeper at the same time, who's been to London in 1905 and been absolutely wowed by all of the institutions in London and describing how much uh, the uh, usefulness of the economic museums at Kew would be to commercial men and were more cases available for exhibiting the material that we've got in the herbarium. So I can see that there's this sort of desire on the museum's part to be showing more botany and particularly to be showing that which is useful to people in the context of the city of Manchester, the academic overseers who want it specifically as a resource for students, just for understanding how to identify plants, and then what the donors give, which is a complete, you know, uncontrollable, um, who knows, things will come in. So I think on the whole, the museum won this argument rather than the academic overseer, because we do have many drawers that are just labeled drugs full of material uh, and often it's come in as sets of things so you can see all these uh, blue labeled envelopes of Joseph Flax and Sons or John, Old, uh, John Ronaldson uh, and then random little individual boxes that people have just brought one thing to donate into the museum so we've got multiple drawers like this full of assorted smaller gifts of um, medicinal plants <clears throat> and so one of the things that we've been looking at, I don't know if you've noticed recently, but the wonderful Biodiversity Heritage Library has started publishing um, a lot of digital resources from Q. So one of the things that they have digitized and got online for you to browse is the uh, specimen distribution books. So Q receiving all of its huge amount of material from all across the empire mm -hmm. is then acting as a sorting house and sending it out to other interested places and organizations. <clears throat> so I have a, a lovely current master's student who is comparing what she can find in this online text with some of our records to see what's coming into the museum uh, and what's been distributed in our direction which might include, of course, things that have gone to other places in Greater Manchester or other individuals who have subsequently donated it to the museum on a later date. So you can see here, F.E. Weiss, despite him not being interested in showing economic botany and wanting to have a herbarium that's strictly for the undergraduates, has asked numerous times for lots of objects from Q to be sent to us at the museum. So clearly the museum was winning the argument. But what's also interesting <clears throat> is that there are lots of names in there that I don't know, um, but our professors, like this Professor Shawlemmer, I think, FRS of Owens College, Manchester, who's asked for two specimens of cat, which I don't want to know about these days because then that brings all sorts of legal problems. Um, <clears throat> but um, this does mean that there's other uh, academics within the university asking for this um, specimens of medicinal plants in particular coming to uh, Owens College, <clears throat> which brings us on, of course, to the Materia Medica collection, ex pharmacy department, of which you went to see the other half, I think, on your trip on Friday. So we have <laughs> detailed in our accession register we apparently hold 833 items of Materia Medica that came from the pharmacy collection, which were likely to have been collected or put together between 1867 and 1915, which was retrospectively accessioned into the museum in 1992. That is the sum total of our knowledge about how we got this material. So, uh, at some point, as the pharmacy is probably moving between buildings, as it is no longer the focus of what the uh, undergraduates are being actively shown and given to, to use and research as they're taught, um, part of the collection is given to the museum, which I have always judged to be kind of late 70s, early 80s, but Gemma tells me that she might have an actual date by next week, which would be really exciting <laughs> to know exactly when this arrived in the museum. I don't really have much sense either of what they decided to keep, 
and what they decided to give to us and what the logic was in, in sharing that out between the organisations either. But anyway, it's very charismatic, it's very lovely. And if we were in the room, it smells amazing because it's all full of eucalyptus oils and, and wonderful aromas that come out as you open the cupboards. Um, and definitely the jars are the most uh, charismatic part of it. So um, <clears throat> we've used them on a, for a number of activities and things. Gemma's lovely labels, which uh, have in keeping uh, arrangement of them. Um, and in the way that the museum does, we incorporate like material. So if we had, say, the plants of the UK from a particular individual, we would add into that another donation of plants from the UK from a different, so that we had the plants of the UK. And so similarly, some tidy minded curator in the past has thought, ah, jars plus jars. And so you, add, you get ones which are probably not from the pharmacy department, but probably came in through a different route, but have been amalgamated into our collection of jars. So these three at the bottom, for instance, from Tate and Lyle are very unlikely to have come from the pharmacy department, but still have added up in the general scheme of everything. So um, for many decades, while this was in the museum, it was arranged according to Southall's Materia Medica, and so grouped into the uh, drugs of vegetable origin and to a lesser degree, the anim animal origin, and according to what kind of part of the plant it was, so the roots and rhizomes and leaves and so on. But for us to find this material to use for people, that was quite difficult uh, given the way it's arranged. And so um, we had a complete overhaul to arrange it um, according to a taxonomic series so that we could pull out, if we had, say, a particular kind of plant for which we had leaves and roots and flowers, we could take them all and show them and use them for events. And so since that time, thank you, Gemma, it has become a very, very much uh, utilised collection for um, events and experiences in the museum. And this one, of course, was the basically the last thing we did in the herbarium before COVID, which was the community curators um, event, where Gemma and a number of other Chisholm students had um, uh, a sort of a training session, I suppose, in how to recognize different characteristics of the glass jars and how that might help you date them and then had members of the public come in and look at our jars and feel for the particular little ridges and bumps and nobbles to be able to say something about uh, the various uh, eras that all of these glass jars were, um, were produced in. So um, that is exciting data that we need to add into our collections to know a bit more about it. Um, and it seems as well that the museum early early years was less excited about jars because a lot of the material we have in jars we also have in boxes um, with these labels that are very sort of standard for the early museum so in order to put them on display they've, they've presumably taken a bit out of the jars reboxed it to put it on display so we have uh, less used than the jars because they're not as charismatic is the boxed material and then beyond that beyond the big series of many many apothecary jars is the incidental other things <laughs> that live alongside it um, so these are absolutely beautiful of which we have very little information again which are slightly larger than a, a sort of large boiling tube i suppose with a, a cork uh, a cork base again all cinchona bark of various different species um, we have large botanical specimens of materia medica so particularly kind of big um, big sort of uh, plaited up swirls of things like smilax roots and so on. So large objects that no one has ever really looked at in any great detail. And then we seem to have a lot of um, assorted bottles and uh, boxes that were presumably for spares for refilling those jars where they were in the original Materia Medica display within the pharmacy department. Um, and along with that, which is why I think we must have got this post-1970, is that this is um, from a pharmacy student who has 
presumably had to do this as part of their assessment. And this is a Materia Medica all boxed together with the specific labels and a, a list of contents dating from June 1970. So given that this came with us to the museum, I think that's probably the point at which um, the, the School of Pharmacy have decided that this is taking up too much space and no longer required for teaching the undergraduates and is now a museum object. And it really is similar, really, in a sense to the whole of the botany collection in that they had um, the, the sort of plant sciences was moving away from wanting to identify plants and thinking more about how they worked and the um, within a cell and so on. And so it's, um, you've got a lot of things which just arrive in the museum with very little information because the, as a whole, the university isn't using them anymore. So this one is to tell you a, something of a success story then. So I feel like, who is it? Uh, that US defense person who had known knowns and known unknowns and all the rest of it. So that's kind of how I feel about a lot of this um, uh, pharmaceutical material in the in the museum is that we have all these known unknowns of things where we they feel there should be more information uh, and this was one of them so uh, my colleague Lindsay had taken uh, they were having a training session for um, new volunteers for handling tables and she thought do you know what I'm going to take one of those boxes of roots just to show people that you can have a really good conversation even if you know nothing about this object so she took this one here and it says Bangba root for kidney trouble, Sierra Leone, Col Richard. Um, and it gives an accession number. And within our accession register, we've got eight objects, um, which is wrong for a start because there's two drawers of them. So there's at least sort of 30, 31 of these. They're all named with the local name for a particular medicine and then what the ailment is that you're going to treat with it complete with a really useful uh, directions for use, which is these roots are placed in a jar covered with water for three days. And the dose is a wine glass full on rising in the morning. If a stubborn case, another glass full at 2 p.m. Um, <clears throat> so she took this along um, and was talking to the, volunteer, the prospective volunteers about how you might have a conversation with the public about these objects. And, you know, imagine what they might have been used for and where, you know, what language this might be in and so on. And one of the other curators was there from the ethnography collection. It was like, oh, I know that name. So it turns out that this Arnold Ridyard is actually quite famous slash infamous in the Northwest in the ethnographic collections. Um, and so he uh, was a chief engineer on, a, on a, um, a ship. I'm going to get my book now so that I get the dates right. Um, so between 1895 and 1916, he spent 21 years at sea on 77 voyages between Liverpool and the west coast of Africa. And so he collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ethnographic objects that he came brought back principally to um, Liverpool Museum, but also distributed to others like us and Bolton. And he was known to have given 100 objects to Manchester Museum thereabouts, of which they only knew of about 75. And that's because the rest of them were hidden in botany and nobody knew that they were part of his original donation. So at the time, the curators had decided this was botany and went to the botany collection and you know, masks and shoes and whatever else was ethnographic and went into the other part. And at that point, all the information relating to our material was lost because this was just put into the botany accession register with no further information. So if we can do this on a scale, even within the museum, then what happens between the various sort of subdivisions of the university, between the pharmacy and the library and so on, it's no wonder that we have to pick up so many threads to try and pull all these things back together. Anyway, so he said that this is what kept him well on his journeys. This is why he was so successful. Uh, on his life at sea, because he didn't rely on the things that he, his contemporaries were getting from uh, pharmacists in Liverpool, because what did they know about a disease you were going to catch in Sierra Leone? So he didn't just co collect these as ethnographic material, unlike all the others. This was what he was actually treating himself with as he went on his voyages. <clears throat> So we can now kind of connect this into a, the whole larger story of uh, this man and his, uh, 
his years at sea, his trade, all the material that came into the Northwest um, and why he was able to do that and to be so healthy. I particularly like, there's one for animal passions and I don't know if that's for or against, but <laughs> I'm not going to try it. Um, so that brings me to the end. So I have to thank, firstly, uh, one of our very long time volunteers, Paddy Moss, who was responsible for a lot of the, the keeping the Materia Medica and, and reading a lot of our fading labels. Um, again, another um, volunteer and intern, Gina Alnat, who did a lot of work in getting material ready for display on the, uh, in our Nature's Library Gallery. The wonderful collective of Chisholm students, <laughs> Gemma, Linnea and Michaela, who came in and, and did all the wonderful community curators um, activities. Our current master's student, Abby, who's working her way through the Q exit books. And then my colleague, Lindsay, who looks after the, the collections on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, they are all the people really who know all the things about things that I then come and talk about at events like this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>